Hallo, mein Name ist Johannes Christmann. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Andreas. Um, if you think machine match is a bad name, you should have uh, heard our previous name that we were considering. It was X und Leonis, uh, which is super confusing. So machine match is a big improvement for us already. Um, also, we didn't find something really cool with the boot in it. Also, we tried to find something with a boot load in it, but it didn't <laughs> Anyway, yeah, maybe machine match or something. Um, yeah, we've been coming to this uh, event like since the first one, I think. Uh, but we haven't done a talk so far, even though Lorenzo uh, tries to force us every time. Uh, but now, since we like officially funded our company this month, um, yeah, it's I guess good timing for us to introduce ourselves properly and uh, give a short rundown of who we are, uh, where we come from, and uh, what this uh, weird game is that we're working on, uh, which is, uh, as Lorenzo said, is called Curious Expedition. So we actually come from uh, the AAA environment. Uh, most of our careers has been defined by working at Jaeger, which is uh, a big games developer in uh, Berlin. Maybe the, I guess, the second biggest uh, AAA developer in Germany after um, Crytek. And I worked there as a senior programmer, and uh, you worked there as a senior game designer. And um, we worked on a couple of projects there, some of them uh, cancelled or unannounced. Uh, but the big one that we actually released in 2012 uh, it was called Spec of the Dime, and it was done for a uh, publisher uh, 2K Games, uh, yeah, which you might also know from like, games like Bioshock or uh, Sith, I think. Um, it was a third-person military shooter, uh, so kind of uh, um, kind of generic game, but uh, it had a uh, strong focus on narrative, which was kind of cool about it. Um, the budget, I don't know, these are not official numbers, but they were somewhere in the newspapers and. My boss didn't tell me otherwise, so I assume maybe they're right. Uh, 40 million, around about. Ooh. Five years of development. Uh, yeah, in-house about 100 people at most. Um, yeah, we released it. It was critically acclaimed. Uh, won a couple of awards at uh, some German award shows. Uh, got good reviews, some mediocre ones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Uh, I was not on stage because I'm especially awesome, but uh, we just randomly chose people from the company. Um, and I won kind of the, the lottery. It's a, it's a pretty large team actually. Um, it's worth to say by the time we released Spec Ops, it was around 100 people probably. So um, that was a cool experience. Um, like I said, it took five years to make the game. Uh, it was a long time. Um, so. Uh, but when we released it, it kind of fell, like financially, I think it fell a bit flat. Um, so, <laughs> it was a disaster! <laughs> but critically acclaimed, I mean, for the developer, it was a, it was a good thing. Uh, because it was very well received in the press and everything. But yeah, financial-wise, I think the last numbers we heard as uh, employees was around, around about 1 million sales. Which, for such a title, is a disaster. Yeah, so um, we got the experience of working in AAA, and what we learned was uh, was kind of was cool. We learned a lot, but uh, if you uh, work in a team of 100 people, like just like math-wise, you have like influence of one percent of the game. And when you think about that, I mean, even though it's a big game, but one percent is really not not that much. Uh, so also um, making. Uh, uh, having a big budget also means that you have to have a lot of mainstream appeal, it has to sell well, otherwise you don't get to make the sequel. Um, so it's really hard to do something special, special in the sense of like something that feels personal about, uh, for you, something you feel strongly about, uh, but also something maybe that's interesting from the game mechanics or like non-generic. So that made us split off and uh, do our own company, which we've been preparing for two years. So for two years we've been working on this um, small game, uh, and that, that now is our main focus. Uh, we just found it uh, this month actually uh, to coincide with the, the grant we got from Medium Board Berlin Brandenburg. Um, yeah, they have a special program for innovative content or something. Uh, there's a really complicated name for it. I don't remember. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're an indie de developer, uh, yeah, check them out. Um, I think the next round is like in a couple of months. Um, they give out a lot of money actually. Yeah, if you have any questions and are considering applying for that, we are more than happy to talk to you about the whole process and give you tips. Yeah, so far it's been a really nice experience. And our, uh, we are just two, two people. Um, 
So I, I focus on the tech side and your focus is on the art side. And uh, all the rest, like game design and business development, we, we split among us. And our goal is to, uh, to kind of stay small and uh, make risky games, uh, games that are kind of weird and that we feel passionate about. So Chris Exposition. Yes, uh, talking about weird games. Um, so yeah, that's where, is this the first slide? Where they're like the, okay, what well, any game, anyway. Um, so yes, uh, we make uh, a roguelike in a, in a broadest sense. Um, there was like an idea process beforehand, like we sat together and discussed a lot of potential ideas. Um, and we finally settled on um, what would become the Goose Expedition. So it's a genre mix. It's really hard to pinpoint where it exactly exists. Um, it certainly has like elements from the roguelike genre. So as Lorenzo initially pointed out, um, roguelikes, probably many of you know about it or some. Anyway, so we take some of the elements, which are, for example, the generic or procedural generation of the game world, uh, which is really nice also, not only for replayability, uh, but also for, for you as a developer, it um, allows you to play your own game, even if you're developing it for a very long time, which is a really, really cool thing. Because um, a horrible scenario for me is like working on a first person, uh, for, for a point and click adventure game, for example, where I know every step through the game, and I lose a sense of what the game is about. A roguelike helps a lot with this, which is also, I think, partly, the reason for the renaissance they are currently living through. Um, and also they are known to be very difficult and complex, and I think we have those checkboxes booked in our game as well. Um, but even more important than the roguelike aspect is like the whole expedition um, part of the game. So where in a normal roguelike, uh, you usually are very close to the, um, to the action. You control one character, and when you move a tile, it's more like one meter or something. But we wanted to have a different scale for our game. So we wanted to have a grand feeling of looking down on the map and planning an expedition, like um, <coughs> when the explorers had like a, a map where they had some charted territories and rough drawings of where the line goes and maybe here's a river somewhere, um, and, and, and have the player move within this kind of scope. So where one field in a roadblock is probably more meter, for us it's more like one kilometer, and we want to have like also decision making for the player when he plans his moves, more on a grander scale, so instead of trying to take care of the hunger clock, which is a favorite element in roguelikes, for one guy, uh, you have to take care of about feeding your whole track, which consists of many, many people. Some of them may only want to eat meat, some of them may be vegan, so you have different problems, right? And, um, and you also have to deal with, uh, with, uh, with tough decisions, uh, which we're going to talk about a little later, which um, is the story aspect of the game. And then um, the, the last aspect is the 19th century, which is probably for us one of the most important things when it comes to marketing the game and talking about it. Because, um, I mean, we've, we've had some, some really good reception about the game, even though we never really released something playable, even though we have something playable tonight with us. Um, and only like showing the concept and showing the theme of the game and the idea of putting an expedition in this time frame um, made people so interested about the game that we had a lot of coverages already and yeah, it's, it's just been great for us and it's very interesting for us as well um, doing the research and the time and finding out about all those famous personalities which we're going to uh, have in our game um, and there's, it's really, really crazy when you start looking into this um, what kind of people were there at the times and what they did um, so that's the that's the three main main areas of the game. Ah, yeah, okay. I thought these slides would have been before that. So anyway, so when we sat down and talked about that stuff, we found that we had like three main um, interests that we shared, um, which allowed us to make the game. So the first was um, our shared in, uh, interest in history, right? So historical expeditions and like the whole time frame and stuff. Both Riel and me, we really enjoy uh, enjoy stories of of that time period. Um, the other one was the, the adventure pitch. Like, okay, Indiana Jones, really, really big, I guess, for our generation, but also a strong influence is uh, Jules Verne, uh, like Mysterious Island is a really, really amazing book, and uh, the old um, Technicolor movies uh, from those times, which they interpreted Jules Verne, were also really, really inspirational to us, especially when it comes to like the whole cheesiness aspect of the whole thing, like giant crabs and dinosaurs and, and all this stuff. And, um, and the last one, uh, which is the, the, the serious side of the game, 
is the Polisium, uh, um, which we had this picture here, um, the big one to the, to the right, uh, which was the most uh, influential one to us concerning the undertone of our game. Because if you want to make a game about that time period, you cannot, um, you cannot move around uh, the racism of that time. So this is from a, from a child's book, a very famous uh, Was ist Was series in Germany, um, where, they, where they clearly portray this guy in front as a hero. Um, however, we have a problem with that, um, and we don't understand how, how this is not like super offensive to many people. Um, to us it is, and it kind of like evokes all those feelings about that time period, and probably what is wrong about this, uh, even though when you are watching movies, for example, like in theater shots and stuff, this aspect is really usually not so talked about. Um, and that's something we really want to put into context in our game. It's a tough thing to do, um, it's going to be a really big challenge. But yeah, if we would leave it out, it would be whitewashing, so we, we cannot not have it. And there's actually a lot of stuff coming from this for us. That's your slide again. Oh. Yeah, uh, regarding the gameplay, so um, the different uh, main aspects are like um, uh, traveling gameplay, which you can see here a little bit. So you have this huge map, which is randomly generated in every playthrough, which is similar to roguelikes. And then uh, you decide where you want to go. And every tile here is uh, one day of distance. So we try to have a really big scale. Uh, you don't manage like uh, moving a couple of meters, but like kilometers. And you don't manage just one guy, but maybe 10 guys at once, and so on. Um, so yeah, then we have a, a certain way how we create the world, uh, where we put in um, villages according to a certain route. So you have to um, talk with natives and like can uh, deal with them. Uh, maybe they try to attack you, and you have to decide how to how to deal with that. We're trying not to do like a, an educational game, but um, we try to put in like critical undertones, maybe. So if the player reflects on his actions uh, regarding like his behavior in this, in this world, that's that's very cool with us. Um, then you will have like um, random events, uh, which might might result in combat. So we have like a, a combat mini game, which is not the main focus, but also in there, uh, kind of similar to fi uh, old Final Fantasy games. Um, and we have uh, multiple choice events where you have to decide when you, you get into dilemmas and you have to decide, oh, do I save this guy or do I let him die and save this other guy? There's more, more on that in the moment. Um, and you have the, the party management, which you see here. So at night they come together uh, around the campfire and then you have to feed them and like decide who do you give uh, which kind of food, and they might, they might have preferences, or they might be like jealous of another guy which gets better food. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, they jump heavily, like a dog. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's nice. nice. yeah you see, the, um, they are so all different biomes, so you can also go to each of the desert. And, uh, um, at, the, at, the, at the beginning, the game is uh, quite kind of realistic, um, but the more you advance, the, the more fantastic uh, it becomes and you encounter like maybe dinosaurs or like zombies and stuff like that. So towards the end it gets a bit crazier. I, I would have one addition in the previous slide, like uh, a big part of the gameplay is also about information um, and how we are conveying information. Like in the top right you see here the cave, uh, there stands cave. So the player knows roughly in that area somewhere there is a cave. Uh, but he doesn't know exactly where. So now it's conveniently placed almost at the letters there when he uncovers the area, but that's not always the case. So um, yeah, information sharing and imperfect information is also part of the game for us. Are you finished? Okay, so sorry, Teddy. Um, yeah, if, if players don't read texts, we are pretty much fucked. Um, <laughs> because we have a lot of text in our game. But we hope to um, put it into a form which is easier to digest for players. Uh, so in a, in, a, in a sense, we are, a large part of our game is a little bit like a twine game, or in case you know it from the Inkle Studios, the sorcery game, uh, which is a really nice iPhone, and I think they released on yeah, Android recently. A very nice game. Anyway, so um, these are the events of our game, what we call them. They are all portrayed basically in a, in a traveling journal, and they are written in past tense of the, it's um, more or less uh, an, not embodied person writing those, not anybody of the track, it's more like the narrator of the game. And he writes the happenings as if they would have happened already. Um, and then you get to choose um, certain, uh, he, he, the player gets to um, choose from certain actions that are coming from those events. 
So, and even though the events are kind of like randomly thrown at the player, they are always coming in chunks, um, which are depending on each other. So, uh, there may be like one event, I don't know which one is this. Yes, this is uh, an example event up there, where in the morning you see uh, a group of elephants passing by, right? Um, it will not go any further than that, it's always going to be about the elephants. And it's enclosed in itself a little mini story, which you're playing through and making your decisions. And every decision you're doing, um, here we are just switching the texts, but it's going to be written in the journal, so it's going to be persistent. So when you go through those events and you make the choices, you're going to write your journal for yourself, which you can then go back and look through, share at the end with other people. So you're building basically your own story. It's not completely randomized, as I said, um, but the, the chunks come inside kind of random. Um, and there's then also a very personal touch to this. We've encountered this, we've done uh, a little friends and uh, family playtesting already, and um, something that really um, motivates us is people start caring a lot about the little characters. Like they are, they are putting them through a lot of stuff, and they are very dispensable other than the main explorer. Uh, usually they die a lot because it's also part of the game, that they get eaten by tigers or killed by traps, and, deadly temples or whatever, but you still uh, care for them and we are working also on like, building up relationships as Riyad mentioned um, between them so, so there's even more story emerging out of the little stories for the characters themselves. Tech, yeah. um, so our platform that we're using, our uh, development environment um, is HTML, so this is a browser game. Uh, which you can play in your browser without any plugins, and so it runs entirely in JavaScript. Uh, we're not using any engines, or just custom stuff. And uh, the development language for the programmers is uh, CopyScript, which compiles to JavaScript. So at your browser, only the JavaScript will arrive, but yeah, I can use something a little bit more beautiful than JavaScript. And yeah, using Sublime Text, which is awesome. <coughs> Okay, we need to speed up a little bit, so um, just so a side note, on the weekend we did uh, this game, it's called Helmcorp, you can play it later, um, we're going to have maybe a machine running it. Um, yeah, yeah and, uh, really last thing, uh, <laughs> the new company now, we're looking for office space, so um, we think it would be awesome to uh, not just have an office space for us, but come together with a, a couple of people, uh, we already have a couple of guys interested, so if you're interested in sharing an office with us, uh, yeah, just talk to us, or if you have an office space that you want to get rid of, talk to us. And uh, it would be cool for us for marketing purposes, so we could be like the Berlin game collector or something and have a blog and stuff like that, which would be where? cool. Which part of the city? We don't know. Uh, wherever. <laughs> with an AB, with an AB would yeah. okay. Maybe within the S-Bahn ring, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've got a question. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, the fan crunch? Okay. Uh, yes, fan crunch. So, uh, who, who knows about the fan crunch? Okay. Okay. So, um, initially we set out and we wanted to have a wide range of explorers in the game, right? Uh, so there was like, in, initially there were immediately like Tesla, obviously, and then Sir Richard Francis Burton and uh, Charles Darwin. And so on and so on. We had a pretty big cast of like seven, eight guys, and we had one female, which was Marie Curie. Um, and we knew kind of initially we wanted to have female explorers in there, but um, we never really got around of doing them. We always had, yeah, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it, but it's not so important right now. Um, and then uh, there were multiple parts coming together. One was that I saw one of the fan frequency um, things from Anita, and I always mess up her last name. Okay, Shakizen. <laughs> or something like this. I'm sorry, Anita. Um, anyway, it was really inspirational because, it, I mean, they all are, but this one was very, very striking to my heart because it was about the Smurfette. Uh, the Smurfette is like you know, a huge cast of characters. One is the female, and her uh, only characterizing thing is, well, she's the female, so that's the only thing that she's about. And I, I exactly saw us falling into this pit, so I said, okay, fuck this, screw this, um, we're gonna connect hers. 
Uh, anyway. Hello, Mom. Um, we gonna stop, or I'm gonna stop working on the game, um, not do any features until I brought up the cast of the explorers in an equal level. So I invested all the remaining time to add female explorers. Which was really interesting to me because initially I thought it would be hard to find interesting ones, but once I started looking and I got a lot of um, um, ideas from the community and people um, offered wiki links uh, to personalities. There's like a huge um, space of, of, of female explorers, which I just don't know because they are usually not taught in school and not so talked about, but they did amazing stuff like Freya Stark or Isabella Bird or Mary Kingsley, like names which are like I know on the surface but never had a really story behind it because all I know is Quatermain. Um, <laughs> It was amazing, and then, yes, that's what we did. We, we ramped up the amount of female explorers. Now we have an even um, spread of male and female, and it, it adds a lot to the game. It helps so much also for us um, when we're playing the game. It makes it much more interesting automatically. So it was a huge success, and on a side note, actually, some of the art we didn't even have to do by ourselves because the community was so enticed about the idea that uh, they actually made a lot of art for us for the game and allowed us to use it. So I didn't have to do anything uh, much <laughs> anyway. It was amazing. Yes. Long, long answer. Any other questions? Uh, it initially started as evaluation, just to see where it is, because since years it's like this, this almost hype about HTML5, which is like, oh, it would be, uh, it's coming up, it's, it's uh, portable, you don't need a plugin, so uh, it's free, it's not, uh, you don't have to buy a license from anybody, so it's pretty enticing. But um, So we, we evaluated the platform and um, our prototype just grew and grew, and so far we haven't run into any walls, so we just kept with it. And uh, the big problem or the issue is, of course, monetizing it later on, uh, which we are not sure how to do exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, later, that, 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 that's one problem. The other, <laughs> the other problem is uh, the perceived uh, difference of like people have like a certain mindset about browser games that they are like casual and free to play maybe or just uh, run by advertising and so on and we wanted to like uh, more like a premium model where people give us like 10 euros or something and then they get a full game uh, so yeah we, we have to see if we can break the mold there yeah. and so the question was uh, that we have already a kind of community and how we got to it and how we built it up right yeah okay so well um, we started pretty early uh, tweeting about the game uh, we joined uh, Screenshot Saturday, um, uh, which was a big thing for us. Um, in case you don't know it, it's a hashtag you're putting into your Twitter um, on each Saturday when you're posting like a raw shot of your current state of the game. And there are, I think, at least two websites right now which are crawling through the Twitter posts looking for the hashtag. If they find it, uh, they take a picture which is applied to that tweet and put it on the website. So each Saturday you have a collection of all the games which use that hashtag and you can easily browse through and see if there's anything um, uh, good on the eye and, and look up for it. And that helped us a lot to get initial attention um, because also many people of the press seem to um, watch this screenshot Saturday very closely and that got us first little uh, previews about the game and opinions about the game. And the other thing uh, was we are very active on the TIG source forums. Uh, where we're having a, a devlog, uh, basically where we put in larger steps of the development and share a lot of ideas uh, with the community, ask them a lot of question, questions, like for example with the fan crunch thing, or when we try to find a name for the game. So we are, we're trying to allow people to already participate in the game, even though it's not so open yet. Um, hopefully that will increase once we start selling the game as well. Um, but alone those two things, like tweeting about the game, uh, having a personal relationship with your Twitter followers and the devlog I have a lot. So the question is... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody played the game yet, right? <clears throat> In addition to the question, the question here asked, it's only the art and the stuff we're posting and nobody ever had it hands-on. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, <laughs> next question. No, <laughs> I think... Uh, what we try to do in marketing is to sell the fiction of the game. I think that's kind of special. So we don't say we are like a roguelike or like a puzzle game or anything. I mean, we state like some genres just to, for, to tick off some, some boxes uh, for journalists. 
But when we talk to them, we actually say we are a game about the 19th century and about expeditions. And I think that is kind of exciting to people for some reason. So they haven't played the game to like uh, break that illusion or something. I don't know. <laughs> kind of just the setting is interesting enough to, uh, to them. So maybe something uh, to think about. Like if you have like a really interesting setting, the gameplay is kind of secondary almost. I mean, I hope we, the gameplay lives up to it. But uh, we already have some nice uh, articles and stuff just based on the on this, uh, time period. So people really picked it up and talked about it on the left floor. Yes, and uh, one addition to this is basically um, we, we heard about the, the FTL game um, after we actually started working on our game. But there's one thing the guys did um, working on FTL, which they usually talk about when they're giving interviews, which also is very true for us, is they Above all, there was their, um, their desire to create a game about a certain topic, right? They, they didn't set out and say, oh, we want to make a, a real-time strategy game or like a roguelike or anything. They wanted to make a game about being the commander on a spaceship on a certain level which was not yet touched by any other game. And that's very similar to us. We're also not setting ourselves up for a certain kind of genre, but we know which kind of fiction we want to have, you know, which kind of like what we want to play up, what we, where we want to put the player, and what we want to allow him to do. Um, and every design decision and everything kind of just comes from that. Um, that's why we don't really have any genre or anything. It's all coming back to the fiction, which is obviously something which is really strong and inspiring to many people. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.